Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DIFF, the Disruptive Innovation Festival, where we ask the question, what if we could redesign everything? Today, we will talk about a specific type of plastic packaging and how we can transform the economy around this plastic packaging to a circular economy. The circular economy in general for plastic packaging has been described as an economy where waste is designed out. So plastic packaging never becomes waste. So it's a system where we keep plastic in the economy and out of the environment. And that is for sure needed because today we are wasting 95% of all the plastic packaging value that we use. And we do that either by burning the plastic packaging, we landfill it, and one third of the 78 million tons of plastic that we use every year is leaked. And what that means is that by the end of this decision, 30 to 40 truckloads of plastic packaging will in fact have leaked into our oceans. So as I said, today we'll be focusing on a very specific type of plastic packaging, and that is the sachets. It's this small type of pla plastic packaging format that has become very popular, especially in the developing countries. And with that, it has also created quite a huge waste managing, management problem. My name is Sarah Wingstrand and welcome to the DIFF. And it's my honor today to introduce Angela Chen. She is a research fellow uh, at Akipeo. And she is joining me from the, uh, all the way from Manila in the Philippines. She will be hosting the conversation with Mark Miley next to her um, around sachets and how we can transform um, these into a circular economy. Um, but before we start this conversation, I would just like to encourage everyone who's watching online to participate actively. We really want your comments and questions, so please post them in the comment box right next to this uh, stream, streaming window. I will be taking your comments throughout the entire session, and I'll be posting them to Angela and Mark uh, towards the end. So uh, sit tight, and Angela, over to you. Great, thank you, Sarah. And thank you everyone who has chimed in or is tuned in for the session. So I'm Angela and I'm honored today to be hosting this conversation with a man of many hats, who is a film director, TV commercial director, script writer, design thinker. Um, I'm sure there are other talents that you have that we haven't uncovered yet, Mark Miley. So we're going to be talking about redesigning the sachet economy in the Philippines. And um, Sarah didn't mention this, but we're also grateful to have Sarah, who is our DIFF host, um, who is also a part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, new plastic economy team. So if you have listened to any of the DIFF sessions this year, you've noticed that ocean plastic has been a fairly popular topic. There's been a ton of sessions on, the, on, on ocean plastic. So we'll sort of dive right into what we want to talk about today, given we only have 45 minutes. Um, and I think overall, this will just be a very fluid conversation between Mark and I and, and, and Sarah, with the audience chiming in um, on sachets. So maybe we can you know, just start with a little bit of context. So the Philippines is a top five polluter for ocean plastic. Number three. Number three, yeah. yeah. It's in the top five, it's number three. Yeah. It's contested whether or not you know, that should be- We're the bronze higher. medalist. Yeah, bronze medalist, third place, not bad. Um, there is you know, overall this need for more infrastructure for waste management, of course. But when we look at the nature of ocean plastic, um, you know, typically I think from Europe or from North America, we see a lot of news about ocean plastic. And one image that comes to mind is sometimes a floating water bottle that's in the water. And that's actually not the reality of what's happening. During beach audits and beach cleanups, um, both you know, at a community scale, but also more of the, the large scale ones, we're finding that the majority of plastics that are being collected is actually thin film plastic. So things like sachets and plastic bags. And that's because something I think audiences or you know people miss from the developed world is that in emerging countries like the Philippines, there's a very robust informal waste collection system with informal waste collectors working in different parts of the waste management chain. And so in the Philippines, 
So PET water bottles um, and hard plastic like um, HTP are actually recycled with up to 90% recovery rate. So the yeah. current system is actually doing a fairly good job recycling those types of plastics. Right. But the types of plastic that are not being recycled um, are the sachets, are the things that we're going to talk about today. Okay. So I actually brought some in from the streets of Manila <laughs> that, that I went out and bought just to kind of demonstrate what they are. Right. So as Sarah was saying, these sachets are used for everything um, that you might need on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Mm -hmm. So right here we have um, toothpaste. Mm -hmm. uh, this is shampoo. It's a two-pack, uh, similar to this. You get like two different sections. And this one is a coffee. So everything between household items, ready-to-go food, um, anything that you would really need um, for yeah for, for your life. And these are made from brands that we know, right? So Nestle. PNG, right. Unilever, and of course some of the local brands. Mm -hmm. um, when when these first got invented, they were an innovation in getting these high quality products to low income consumers in developing countries, where you know where maybe previously they were not able to access these because of the high cost of buying this in bulk. But of course, this has come at an environmental cost um, of of it not being able to be recycled and and sort of staying in the in this case the marine ecosystem ecosystem. Um, so how can we really, you know, design this status quo system to serve, to continue serving the consumer that these products are serving, but also to redesign it around um, protecting the environment? Actually, the, the, there's, there's the dependence on, yeah. on that type of yeah. packaging because... Okay, let's talk about that. Right. That's kind of maybe not so understandable. From mm -hmm. somebody, you know, listening that might be buying a bottle of shampoo and say, like, why, why do you need this? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, to to you have to go back all the way to how uh, the average Filipino is getting their salary. Yeah. Uh, a lot of uh, Filipinos, especially from the working class, uh, get their salaries at the end of the week. Yeah. And then it's not. It doesn't mean that they're working every day. Or you know they they're paid daily, but they if they, they get to work only three times a week, they will only they will only get their their salary what they work for uh, in three days, mm -hmm. and uh, they cannot make uh, bigger purchases like they could not uh, buy for example a a jar of coffee or a, a bigger pack of toothpaste yeah. or and in this case uh, uh, a, a bottle of shampoo yeah so they are actually they only get to you to buy what they can afford but if you put them all together mm -hmm. the the total in terms of volume they're actually paying more uh, about 20 percent more than yeah. what, what they could have uh, save if they if they buy it in bulk or if they buy it in in a larger container. Uh, so they they only buy what they they can afford for the week, and then even in that case, like the the toothpaste for example, yeah. they try to squeeze it you know yeah. uh, uh, as the, the smallest amount that they yeah. so that they can extend uh, something like that should should last them yeah. about four or five days, uh, they're going to extend it for a week, right. you know, for two or three more days. Uh, and same thing with, with shampoo. So effectively, uh, I, in my study, they, the, the, the nearest or the most accessible uh, center of, of trade is called mm. the Sari Sari store. Right. It's like a convenience store yeah. uh, and a neighborhood store, but it's in a, on a smaller scale. And then all most of the th items that they they sell there are are the things that people buy on a daily basis. So people practically look up to the Sari Sari store as the an extension of their pantry. Right. So it's you know it's uh it's actually there's no uh, Sari Sari if you step out of your house in 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 a community in the Philippines. Uh, the nearest size star store would sh should at least mm -hmm. not be more than ten meters away. Right. So right. it's very it's very close. It's very convenient, and you know uh, the sachet, be, it being already more expensive, 
uh, the 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 plus uh, we were not even mentioning that the Sari Sari store adds uh, profit from from uh, from by selling it in a in a convenient and accessible right. place. So it even costs more uh, a lot more uh, than they would if they buy sachets in a supermarket. Yeah, but that's the that's the most accessible uh, store that they can purchase daily items. And apparently, in these size size stores, the top 10 items, mm -hmm. uh, coffee, number one, shampoo, number two, uh, detergent uh, powder, number three, uh, diapers, or, or milk, okay. number, anyway, the yeah. top, all of them, yeah. you could buy them. And they're all available right. in sachets, yeah. small single-use uh, yeah. containers. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the one thing that struck me, it's I think the sachet um, mentality extends beyond just sachets physically. Right. Like one of the things I think that surprised me moving um, to the Philippines was that you could buy phone credits on a daily right. basis, <laughs> which was also a right. part of against the sachet economy. It's dematerialized, it has nothing to do with plastic, but it just kind of shows to how um, commonplace this practice is. Right? You can buy a single cigarette. Yeah. You can buy... You, you know, noticed. Yeah, I mean, I don't smoke, but you know, anything that you want can be just in the tiny, tiny quantity. Yes. As if you were going away somewhere, you were traveling, you were going on a weekend trip, uh -huh. and you just needed that, right? right. Like, in, in my mind, convenience for the reason, but it, the reality is that it's, it's really an affordability. Affordability. And uh, you look at the consumer segment, uh, when you divide them kind of into income, mm -hmm. it's... Here it's called class A, B, C, D. Um, class C, D, and E are the ones that are accessing sachets. Yes. And you know, there's about 100 million Filipinos um, currently. And so even if half of them access sachets, even just one a day, you already have 50 million sachets per day. Exactly. Yeah. And to think that in other countries, you can only buy sachets or single-use uh, items in, in single-use containers. As a travel, uh, mm, as a yeah, travel right. option. So if you're, you know, going camping out, yeah. or you, need, you know, just need a small amount that, that's, that's yeah. available. Yeah. So can you let's step back a little bit? Um, I know you've also in the past shot commercials for some of these consumer goods companies, right. and and really, um, as a marketer, really have to get into the psyche of like how to sell this product. Can you share with us a bit more? You know, how did you decide right. to research right. sachet as a topic, um, and and then how did you decide is, you know, zone or hone in on shampoo as something that you wanted to describe. Yes, I've been directing TV commercials since the 90s. And uh, in my research, apparently it turned out that with the introduction of, of sachet packaging, yeah. uh, the, the volume is double what they sell. Uh, shampoo bottles, uh, shampoo mm -hmm. bottles is only a half of what uh, in terms of sales. Yeah. The, the 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 sachet uh, the, the FMCG companies earn uh, with sachets. Yeah. So there's there's more income that they are getting, more revenue with with uh, sachets. And then initially it was just supposed to be that for 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 travel purposes. So there wasn't even a you know it wouldn't even need a a advertising or TV commercial. But apparently, uh, since this is the only thing that that people can afford uh, on a daily basis, uh, they started uh, promoting and encouraging people to use more, uh, to use uh, shampoo, coffee, uh, toothpaste in, in sachet packaging. Yeah. And uh, when I was directing uh, these TV commercials, I was surprised because normally if you would direct or if you would come up with a, a shampoo commercial, you would talk about the quality or the benefit that you get from mm -hmm. using the shampoo. So you know, nicer shiny hair. Right. It's the one where they show the hair, like yes. the before so, picture so. and then the after. Right. 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 Uh, but this time, they're just talking about you know, uh, we have more shampoo. Like you know, it's twenty percent more. Oh, so I think. Half. Sorry. Yeah. If you look at it. Yeah. See, it even oh, yeah, says. Oh yeah, this one says twenty. See, even that this one says fifty percent more. Right. So they would do ads. Not to promote the the the, the benefit of the product, mm. they would do ads to promote the the packaging. Mm, I see. And I, I found it strange, uh, event initially, that 
it, it's just kind of weird why you're promoting, you're advertising the packaging. And then given the fact that it's actually costing the consumer or the customer more if they buy things in packaging, but they never say that. They just say, hey, you get 50% more. Right. But actually what's interesting, and I don't know, I think well, Paul Mollo is going to hate me for this, but the average size before of a shampoo, if you buy shampoo in a sachet, is this large, okay? Now, they just divided it into two, mm -hmm. and then said it's 50% more, because this is what you get for one, when in fact, it's actually 50% less. I see. So before it used to be this much, and now they're selling it, uh, they just you know divided mm -hmm. it into two, yeah. and then say that it's 50% more, yeah. so you get more. So, so from your research, actually, I know you looked into the consumer behavior, how people are actually using these. Uh -huh. Can you tell us a bit more about okay. like, what you found? Because I thought that was pretty unique. Right. Uh, if, if you go to hotels uh, or resorts uh, in the Philippines where they also distribute uh, shampoos, normally this the, every day they would uh, give you, if it's a no, no, cheap resort or cheap hotel, they would give you a sachet of shampoo that you could use to, uh, yeah. to bathe it with every day. Uh, but what the most Filipinos do is they would uh, they would use a dipper. Yeah. What is a dipper? It's a okay. it's container a with yeah. a handle. It's a plastic <laughs> container, uh, like one-third the size yeah, like of a, a pail. pail. Yeah, yeah. One, okay, so it's small. One-third the size of a pail with a handle that you use to uh, you dip the, the dipper into the water and then you shower with it, bathe right. with it. It's actually, it saves a lot of water, I think. Yeah, yeah, it saves a lot of water. It's very practical. It's very Asian, I think. I mean, <laughs> they have it in Indonesia, yeah. Malaysia, of course, Japan. Uh, so instead of using this whole shampoo yeah. to, you know, uh, for your hair, for one shower session, they would actually, you know, uh, dip a pail of water, get, get a dipper full of water, and then drop three drops or pour three drops, three or four drops, drops yeah. of the shampoo, try to mix it, and then uh, try to slowly put it on their hair and yeah. then make a lather. Right. And then slowly make a lather. So they actually extend uh, the, life. The, the life <laughs> yeah. of, of the shampoo. Uh, by, by doing that, so they yeah. could actually have more, uh, instead of just using it once, they could actually use it for uh, at most like five times, Yeah, something like that. I find that so interesting. I mean, that's obviously linked to the affordability of stretching the, yeah. the bang for the buck you're getting mm -hmm. out of this. And in a culture context, also, I guess, social economically, I think in general, when people talk about the circular economy, there's this sense of abundance of their, you know, needing to uh, some sort of, you know, behavioral change for people to value waste. But in reality, in Asia, there is this culture of frugality. Right. And <laughs> people do try to s stretch something as, you know, as much as they can. <laughs> I, I, was, I, was, I was speaking to one mother, and one of the reasons she said that she's not buying the large bottle of shampoo yeah. is because her children tend to abuse it. It's like, wow, you know, there's a lot of it. So instead of, uh, right. instead of having a, a large bottle, they would have that because they try to stretch it further. So right. uh, they would have, this, or or if, if they don't have this, they would have a small plastic bottle where they put the shampoo and then just the, the sachet it into the sh into, into the, the smaller. So yeah. so even if they have a large bottle, they still put it there, so they still get to stretch it, yeah, and di dilute it more yeah. uh, instead of you know because if there's a tendency that if you have a whole bottle, you keep pumping the. Yeah. The There's no portion control. Right. It's like rationing. So, you yeah. know, so it's also, you know, uh, because of the behavior, the bathing habits, right. uh, bathing behavior of, of her children. And that's why she she prefers using the yeah. sachet as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so fascinating to me. <laughs> also, like how hair is being washed. Um, what do you, I guess, like through the research, you've looked into the bigger picture of, you know, how... Um, popular the sachet economy is, and you, you look specifically at shampoo. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons was that you thought, um, if I remember correctly, you thought that was something as a, a product that could be more 
easily um, disrupted in terms of how it could be distributed. Because right? sachets right now is a distribution method of getting right. the product into right. the hands of consumers right. who don't want to pay a lot right. and want to buy these tiny quantities right. every single couple of days. Um, if we're talking about foods, it might be much harder because there's then the safety integrity issue, of how it gets transported, how it gets stored. Yeah. Um, can you share with us a bit more of you know what were the different models you were thinking of right. when you were looking at creating a system that could displace sachets essentially without using sachets, still get the product to the hands of the consumer for the small amount of price. Right. Uh, eventually, the 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 idea that I had is to set up refilling stations, yeah. uh, and they, they have it in in, uh, in the UK, uh, in the US also, and in Canada. Uh, stores that are uh, that sell uh, shampoo. Yeah. Cleaners. Yeah, would you call that would you call that a, a zero waste store or would you say it's a bit different? Because I think the zero waste store concept, which now has become right, very popular, yeah, yeah. is very posh in a sense. Like it's uh -huh. it's not for the type of audience that we're talking about that would go to a sorry sorry store, right? They're they're like you know right. they're, they're premium um, right. product and experiences right. uh, for people to go to the stores and pump things that are you know get stuff in bulk. Well, you know, uh, to give credit to to uh, top uh, FMCGs yeah. manufacturers, uh, in my research, it, it turned out that they're actually they actually considered uh, coming up with uh, with well, they didn't call it zero waste stores then; right. they just call it like uh, refilling stations. Because uh, to this day, there are a lot of Items like cooking oil, soy sauce, um, shrimp, uh, shrimp base, uh, vinegar yeah. that you could actually buy in the market if you just bring your own container or own bottle and then just you know ask for whatever amount that, or volume that you want and then yeah. they would give it to you. Yeah. And then so the idea of why not shampoo? Yeah. Or why not soap? Uh, it's not actually new. Yeah. So they, they considered the idea, but at that time they said they, it wasn't as successful or they, didn't, they realized that they, can, they couldn't get critical, critical mass or at least um, a mass following because uh, the connection, at least psychologically, uh, shampoo, toothpaste, uh, soap are beauty products or products that you put, uh, you know, you make you cleaner yeah, and, and, and right. better. So it's like, and then to like put it side by side or be sold or more or less in the same environment as soy vinegar, sauce yeah. and, and cooking oil and vinegar. So there's, and then the idea that I would have to bring something, like a container that I'm gonna use for my body that would make me look mm. cleaner and better, uh, did not sound appealing. Uh, and so they, they, or they, they came up with pop-up uh, refilling stations yeah. that sold their their branded shampoos, and in their research, uh, it it wasn't uh, it didn't get that much traction. Yeah, and this was uh, several years ago. This was like the nineties. Right. Uh, so they already somehow foresaw the problem, mm. uh, but they said you know at that time they realized no, it's not yet a bigger a big problem. Mm. Uh, and then, like, sachets are doing well, so right. they didn't do the anything is. yet uh, at that time. Uh, fast forward to now, actually, there are refilling stations, uh, and it's kind of chic. It's kind of, wow, you know, it's for the environment, but uh, we call it mm, uh, stores that actually cater to... We, we call it here middle class, but mm -hmm. middle class in yeah, in the U.S. dollar term is view. different. Right? It's yeah. different, but they're actually uh, more on the A B yeah A B market. So it's kind of uh, and then at the same time, uh, people were not buying sachets otherwise anyway. Right. They're buying yeah, the yeah, exactly. yeah. So so they they don't buy they don't they and they cannot imagine them bringing a a container of their own. Because normally they can afford a, a large shampoo bottle anyway, and uh, so they what they uh, it's not 
attracting the people who are actually using the mm. the the sachet. So in terms of concept, uh, it's okay or intention, it's okay. But uh, for for you know the bigger market or the bigger customer that we should uh, talk to mm. are are the people from the from, from the lower income groups. And then so I thought it has to be accessible. So and that's why uh, I realized that if if ever there's going to be a refilling station or, mm -hmm. or a spot where they could have their own refill yeah. of at least a shampoo, beginning with shampoo, which is the number two product yeah. uh, that uses sachet, should be sold at the Sari Sari stores. Right. Right? So, uh, and then there were issues also uh, on Sari Sari stores uh, because you, although you could provide the Sari Sari stores with oil, pump containers, mm -hmm. uh, there is a lack of trust, I guess, from the FMC or the, 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 the manufacturer of the, the product, shampoo manufacturer of the yeah. product because they might try to dilute it mm -hmm. so that they can earn more. Right. Uh, and in fact, what you're giving the customer eventually would uh, would make it uh, be low, low quality. quality. Yeah. Low quality. So, uh, on my research, I and basically like what I've seen being done in, in Japan, for example, mm -hmm. are vendo machines. Yeah. So I thought if we could use vendo machines placed in sari sari stores, and there are some vendo machines that sell other products. Like water. Like water, uh, and, and and soft drinks and beverage. Mm -hmm. uh, using vendo machines, they they then it's possible to to have a refilling station this time. Uh, dispensing uh, shampoo. Mm -hmm. So I eventually uh, built a prototype of a shampoo vending machine mm -hmm. where you could bring your own container and then uh, put a coin and then have your own. I, actually, you end up paying uh, less right. and then you get a lot more than this one. <laughs> And, right, and um, do you feel like that model could work for other things like like toothpaste, which is I guess relatively eventually, yeah, food. yeah. I actually, yeah, I actually uh, met with uh, I met with uh, the vendo manufacturer, the largest right. vendo manufacturer in the Philippines, and he said it's possible. Uh, and they actually consider that. Uh, and then I also realized that some other countries, and one of them, uh, one company is actually a an Ellen MacArthur Foundation fellow. Okay. Uh, did a similar project, but uh, dispensing uh, different items like beans. Okay. Uh, this was in Latin America, I think, right? Yes. Or some, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's that's really it's cool. called Algramo. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, know the I think it's from Chile. That's awesome. Um, I wonder if, okay, hold on, let me put on my headphones. Um, I wonder if we want to bring Sarah in, um, if you're seeing any questions from the audience at this point. Yes, we're definitely seeing comments and questions from the audience at that point. Thank you very much. Um, so this has been really interesting. We have a question from Andy from Twitter. It looks like it's a problem of accessibility and affordability. What is the role of government in changing this damaging situation for our environment, but making sure citizens can still get the goods they need on a daily basis? So I guess we're we're starting to look at it also a little bit more on a holistic, um, with a holistic approach here. So what's the role of government? Uh, very interesting question. Actually, I think the the solution is not a product solution. Uh, so it's not just saying that the vendor machine is is the solution, or you know, coming up with uh, a different packaging system will be a solution. So it has to be a whole system of distribution on how we could you know from from the manufacturer to the distributor. To the sari sari stores, to the customer, and eventually what comes, what happens after that. Uh, but what the government, although the government recognizes the problem, mm -hmm. 
they are looking at, they're seeing the problem as a sachet problem. So it's a sachet problem, so it's a waste problem. Uh, and they're not seeing it from, they're not looking at the bigger picture. I, I think it's an economic development problem. Like if you, so let's say the Philippines is projected to grow 8% GDP until 2025. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that those who are buying sachets now in a couple years time will be wealthy enough to not need to buy sachets? I would say 20 years ago, sachets were also a thing in China, but now we don't really see them anymore because people are you know, relatively middle class right. and they can afford bottles. I mean, my initial, like when I first heard about the, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing of like, you know, you're paying 20% more, it's a financial literacy issue, mm -hmm. but there's a be there's always, there's also the, the idea of like, can you, my, <laughs> this is crazy, but my <laughs> initial reaction was like, can we have a microfinance model to finance people to buy bottles of shampoo so they don't need to buy sachets? Not to say it's totally out of whack, but right, right. It's, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of on the unit economics basis on the consumer. Mm -hmm. it, they are not looking at it as saying sachets are killing turtles or, right? Like it has nothing yeah. to do with the waste. Right, right. It's just a function of the fact that they are not able to afford right. something that's involved. So right. I think, yeah, I mean, but, no, I, I, but in general that the, everybody just needs yes, to yes. improve their, their right. um, economic status. But I think for a specific policy um, that the government could do to help with this is has some sort of policy that even just clarifies on the um, legality of people selling things in bulk. I uh -huh. think that would be helpful because right. let's say now if you know it's not very clear if somebody wants to start a zero waste or a store right. on whether or not they can actually legally sell things that are in bulk to consumers. I think that hinders the potential of that model. I think it's possible. Uh, there are several cities right now yeah. uh, from the local government level yeah. uh, who made a policy banning the use of plastic wrappers, basically plastic uh, like shopping bags mm -hmm. in plastic. Yeah, plastic bags. Yeah. Plastic bags. So initially, this there was a lot of complaints. And, yeah. You know, clamor against yeah. you know the the policy and saying that it's not practical it's come on but eventually people start start uh, following it and they, they couldn't you know they couldn't do yeah. anything about it yeah they have to abide by by the regulation and uh right that you, like i i am happy that uh certain uh, fast food restaurants several rather several fast food restaurants are no longer using plastic straws. Yeah. So it's not even a government regulation. Yeah. But you will still see customers complaining, like, you know, I'm driving my car. How can I drink like my yeah, beverage right. without a straw? But eventually, you know, it, yeah. it, they will follow. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if you're you're probably familiar with the Boracay right. uh, island, that they have to clean up the whole. They close down the whole island and clean it up. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the government can do something about it. Uh, right now, there are a lot of uh, small uh, cities who are uh, addressing it. But like what I said, it has to be a system rather than just, you know, let's stop using straws or let's stop using plastic bags. So it has to be, uh, a system has to be created uh, so that, it's not just, it doesn't become a packaging issue. Yeah. I mean, ultimately right now, I think not just in this, but in every single environmental issue we're facing is whatever is more environmentally friendly, better for the environment, it costs more and right. it's not as attractive and that's why it's not scalable. Yes. In the straw example, I think it's great that straws became sort of the flag barrier for um, the plastic waste issue because there is an easy alternative, right? I mean, people, like somebody asked me recently, like, bamboo straws or stainless straws and i said don't use a straw right like why do you need it <laughs> use your mouth right like in, in the cases you don't need to use it um but for sachets i guess a, a, a part of it is there is no alternative right now like if you ban these things today mm -hmm. then these products are no longer accessible right. to the majority of the population which, Actually, which would be a right. severe social issue actually yeah no but even even uh because when I was talking to the 
the vendor manufacturer, the vendor machine manufacturer, he said that you'll be surprised. It's actually the government who is against uh, any form of dispensing right. items or right. products. And that's what I mean would help if they put out some sort of policy that then encourage the development for that, those type of models. To yeah. say that there's some guidance around how, you know, like this is actually allowed or right, right, in the right. same way that if, let's say, right. the government doesn't have any policy mm -hmm. that allows recycled PT, Right. Then, then you know these manufacturers are not going to use right. recycled PT water bottles because they're not sure if you know how you know how, how is it looked upon um, regulation. Like, like I, I, I was telling, just yeah, sorry. Coming back to your point about you know government, for example, putting in um, policies on bans of certain types of plastics. Um, we have a question online from Joe Miller that asks if the government banned uh, sachets. Does Mark think that this would just create other equally problematic unintended uh, environmental consequences. So could you see any environmental um, backlash of banning uh, sachets? Uh, if, if they ban it, actually it's more, it's going to be more of an economic issue more than an environmental issue. Uh, and I don't think a lot like, you know, uh, major FMCGs will, will not you know, we'll do whatever it takes to to for that not to happen. Uh, but of course, you know there are. Having said that, the FMCGs that I've I've spoken to uh, are aware of this problem, and they're part of the uh, BioStock Feed uh, uh, BioFeedStock Alliance mm -hmm. BFA. Uh, where they are trying to find alternatives uh, to single plastic uh, packaging. Uh, and they have found uh, ways of doing that, but they, they're just limiting. So it's not 100% uh, plastic. So a lot of it is bio, uh, like 30 or 50% of it is bioplastic. It still uses petroleum-based uh, uh, plastics. So hopefully, because uh, uh, we, we've seen technology uh, where plastics can be uh, made from, from sugar cane, from, uh, from seaweed, but it not to scale it uh, to, to the, the volume that we need, at least you know, to fulfill uh, the, the packaging requirements, at least for the shampoo part. So it's, it can happen. But it's not gonna happen right now because it doesn't have. We don't have a clear, uh, a clear alternative yet to single-use plastics, unless they, you know they, they consider doing it, uh, doing the, the refilling station. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know we're talked a, a lot about sort of like the bottom of view of what it looks like for somebody using sachets. What is sort of like the reality. I want to bring Sarah in because I know there is a lot of um, international momentum around ocean plastic. There's been a lot of corporate commitment that's been made in the last year, some from these FMCG companies, the consumer goods companies that we're talking about on making their packaging recyclable, making sure, you know, and some of those are pretty short timelines, like 2025. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of R&D, I think, in-house looking at how to technically recycle sachets, which up until recently has been a challenge, right? Because of the multi-layer. Uh, actually, and that. it's also you know even if uh, they come up with alternatives right now, they still cost more mm -hmm. than even the the PT bottles. Yeah. So until they can lower the the manufacturing cost of the containers, yeah. Then yeah, yeah. they're gonna be using sachets for that. Absolutely. Sarah, do you want to chime in on that? Well, yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, of course, right now with the alternatives that we have, it's technologies that have been only only been around for uh, a couple of years, maybe, whereas um, producing sachets from fossil feed, feedstock has been around for 50 years or more. So I think there is both a technological development and maturity that needs to happen. And of course, we also need some kind of, of scale uh, to the alternative type of plastic packaging in order for it to compete in, in 
in economies and, and countries like uh, the Philippines because because there the margin is really um, essential. A price increase will kill something like this most likely. Um, actually, we have a question also from Piotr that uh, many households probably have other bulks, sort of like powders or liquids at home. So when they buy these sachets, do they buy four to six at a time? Um, and then will the price essentially, you know, be the same in the end? No, actually they, they, they don't buy a lot of it. Uh, they only buy two or three at a time, even sometimes yeah. even one. Yeah. Uh, because since they're getting their salary, uh, their salaries at the end of the week, and that's the only time that they can plan whatever it is that they need to purchase. And the second thing is they don't buy these items from a supermarket or a, a market. They buy it from the sari sari stuff so like from a from a it's like it's like a 7-eleven convenience store but like one third or one fourth the size so and in the in the home of your neighbors right? and it's in the neighborhoods yeah. like really like literally it's not even a block away uh and what when you if you see a if you google if you just search uh sari sari store what what do what you will see is in, in on the counter Right above the the counter are are the stacks of uh, of the different products, all in in sachet form, uh, in sachet packaging. Can I? So it's can, that accessible. Yeah. yeah. Can I just briefly ask you also the so the sari sari stores definitely seem to have to play a key role in in transforming the sachet economy to a circular economy for the Philippines. So are they are they getting the message and are they on board or Oh, what is your feeling on this topic? Actually, uh, the the uh, there's a uh, an Accenture study, especially in Southeast Asia, that that states that the sari sari stores, although they do not they do not earn as much as the big stores or the supermarkets, they are actually the control the the market in terms of distribution so uh you know all of these products to say that you know uh they sell twice the amount in terms of volume they sell twice the amount of shampoo or twice the amount of coffee and they're all being sold inside inside stores uh just illustrates how powerful the the concept of the sari sari store is as uh, as uh, as the center of trade so uh, the, the the study says that it can shape behavior sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, and that yeah, there's a, there, they they can play a big role uh, in in switching uh, the Philippines from a sachet economy to a circular economy. And I think that's actually a perfect note to end on that, uh, you know, the Sari Sari stores, as well as the rest of the plastic value chain, has a huge part to play in transforming the sachet economy to a circular economy. Um, I would like to thank Angela. I would like to thank Mark for taking your time this evening for you, this morning for me, uh, to talk about sachets. I found it very, very interesting. And if any of you out there are interested in learning more, um, Mark has actually said that he will make his dissertation available to us via a link that we'll post on our website after this session. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to continue the conversation online. Also, if you're watching a recording on this, please post your comments and post your questions. We are very happy to, um, to incorporate them into our own thoughts. Um, there is a lot of other stuff going on in the diff throughout the rest of the next week. That will be the last week of uh, the diff. Um, if you're interested in plastic, you should basically just stay tuned because the next session will be also about plastic. It's called Plastic by Use Phase Decision Making Tools to Tackle Plastic Waste. It's at 12 o'clock. It's about, you know, making a decision to change a product's design or its packaging isn't easy. 
Could these tricky decisions be simplified by assessing plastic products or packaging in a new way? And then tonight, we have our live studio, studio running, and there we'll be talking about universal basic income. Is that an idea whose time has come? So imagine if every citizen was giving a five-figure sum of money by the state every year, no questions asked. This is the idea behind universal basic income. And then on Monday, we'll be talking about bees. Can solar farms help save the bees? This session will be on at 6 p.m. Um, and with that, I would just like to thank everyone once again for tuning in. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure to listen to you um, and your opinions on sachets. And um, keep up to date on thinkdiff.co. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.